Good afternoon, or rather still good morning to everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work, particularly to the organizers and also to the Gates Foundation. Our topic is looking at Cape Verde and Mozambique's development successes. Um, but when you try to understand what success is, that's where the difficulty comes in. Hopefully we'll have one or two good insights which will convince you that uh, we've, we're on the right track identifying what constitutes success for these two countries. Uh, outline of my presentation, we're looking first at motivation, giving you interpretive framework, and then looking at uh, empirical analysis, the results, and the intuition. That's my focus before drawing some conclusions. Oh, sorry. Let uh, me go back home. Page up. Uh, here we go. Home. There we go. Sub Saharan Africa. We know that Sub Saharan Africa has been doing relatively well until the crisis. Uh, but we also know that uh, the development hasn't been sufficient to ensure uh, progress, for example, on the Millennium Development Goals. The problem is knowing what to do, what are the right policies, what are the right institutions, and also how to implement the reforms on the institutional front and the policy front, which will then allow you to achieve better progress in terms of economic development. Uh, so getting constitu constituency for reform is not easy, and we know sometimes that this is perhaps easier on the regional level, where the affinity is either on geographical basis, and we would argue also on historical grounds. Uh, so the inter regional integration has a lot to do with perhaps finding the constituencies for uh, policy and institutional reform. Well, this doesn't often happen, and perhaps the best uh, known example is uh, the EU. We know that uh, what a unique countries try to resolve common problems. And the way to do this is to come up with a cooperative framework which allows you to produce what we call mutual knowledge about policies, institutions, monitoring at uh, this level. Uh, so there's peer pressure and peer comparison which will then allow you to implement the reforms and the policies you, you you decide upon. However, outside the OECD, this approach is uh, rather so. Knowledge uh, is not an easy task. But within the Portuguese community, there's a recognition that this is part and parcel of development effort. CPLP is the community of Portuguese-speaking countries. You have them there in the map in the background. Uh, this is a relatively recent group, but in its 2006 Bissau Declaration, they emphasize the need for mutual knowledge. And here we have uh, history or cultural affinities, as you will, complementing geographical affinity in order to come up with the mutual knowledge necessary to implement policy and institutional reform. Taking this one step further, within Africa, the five Portuguese-speaking African countries, a group known as PALOP, they've also come together because they recognize they've got common problems uh, which they want to tackle. And here, obviously, it's not the geography. As you can see, they're very diverse. So in this sense, there is a recognition that they have something in common uh, which allows them to work together to also promote development. Within Africa, why did we focus on Mozambique? Well, there's a widespread recognition that both countries are trying to overcome adverse conditions and they're doing something which appears to be going well. In terms of geography, Cape Verde state with little natural resources and a very adverse climate. Mozambique has history, of, uh, bad history in terms of it's trying to overcome, or rather trying to overcome the consequences of a civil war, which is very protected at the height of the Cold War. And yet both countries have, have increasingly adopted policies and promoted institutions which are actively contributing to what we're going to see a little later in terms of development. 
just a few graphs to give you an idea. Here we have Cape Verde compared to a regional grouping, the West African Development Community, ECOWAS. We're looking at per capita income, 1990 international dollars. Uh, and here we have the regional average and the Cape Verde average. And as you can see, Cape Verde is performing in the more recent period as outperforming its region. Uh, to a lesser extent, but also true, we see Mozambique on a path which is putting it beyond its uh, regional. And even if you compare it to historical based grouping, when you look at Pelop, uh, the Pelop group is more volatile, but uh, it performs and compares favorably with, in this case, the southern sub Saharan African grouping. We looked at other comparisons. Our focus will be on trade, diversification, and we see in what way this contributes to economic convergence in both countries. But we had a concern about looking at macroeconomic policy and financial reputation. We looked at the Millennium Development Goals and governance indicators. Uh, as I said, foreign trade and economic growth are our focus. We tried to adopt a broader approach. Uh, that's in our paper, most of those results, and in two annexes which uh, detail the studies, the complementary studies which accompany our uh, analysis. But for now, to this aspect here. Also, here, Francisco is present. He had a hand in providing us some data which allowed us to look at the World Bank Enterprise Service. Idea of what these two countries are doing on this. Cape Verde has more developed financial markets, greater macroeconomic stability, lower corruption, and the state where the rule of law is more grounded, but less, and he has the, the less, less exported oriented firms, less technology licensed to foreigners, higher taxes, and a higher regulatory environment. And again, we have a, a combination in most others, less well placed. Uh, that generally is the situation a mix, and the idea is obviously that you're giving more weight and you're giving emphasis and you're pushing forward those positive aspects which will allow countries to move forward. What's our interpretation framework? Thank you. No problem. Um, so I was now going to tackle our interpretive framework. Uh, how are we thinking about this problem? As I mentioned, defining success is not easy, especially when you're trying to do it at a macro level with limited data. Uh, and you can, while you're reading that, uh, what we're really trying to say is development is really a question of managing two things, resources and relationships. You do that in a specific context. Uh, globalization, for example, will allow you to access to perhaps uh, different opportunities in terms of relationships, in terms of resources. Governance, the institutions and the policies will determine how effective you are at making use of both resources and relationships and the interaction between both aspects. And this kind of topic, how globalization and governance interacts in, to produce convergence, uh, is a relatively recent concern, uh, especially as globalization is all dominant. But in, if you think about it, the problem is really you've had successive waves of globalization. What's changed over time very often is the context, which is determined by history and geography. Uh, one of the recent studies by Eigen Green and LeBlanc, they've looked at the impact that globalization had on democracy and vice versa. We looked at that relationship. Um, uh, given our backgrounds and our research interests, we understood that you can't just look as something as static as democracy, whether you vote or don't vote, but you had to look at the quality of the institutions which were behind that, and we found that this relationship was sensitive to regional context and convergence. So our model, what's in our heads when we tackle this problem? In that paper, we had convergence uh, uh, to the frontier, in this case, the United States GDP capita. Uh, we had globalization, and we looked at freedoms, uh, political freedoms, civil, uh, here we have the two components, political rights, civil liberties. We also looked at economic freedom. Uh, here's an example of one, some of the relationships we had. What we're going to do now is have this in our heads and collapse these freedoms into both. So we're looking at the relationship between convergence uh, as measured by the gaps to the income frontier, the United States, and globalization, which we take to be a measure of trade diversification. That's our, what's in our heads. And we're trying to understand this relationship. So how do we measure success? 
Well, we're going to look at this relationship, and we're going to seek to identify policy and institutional determinants of successful export diversification and convergence for ECOWAS and SADC, firstly. The context is important, as, we'll, as I'll explain shortly. And then we'll see to what extent the lessons that we can draw from these two regions apply to the respective countries. So what's our model? We aim to have a medium, meaningful characterization of this divergence, diversification convergence relationship where we have policy and institutional variables as well as certain control variables. Economic convergence, we measured the income gap. The idea is uh, if you close the gap, you will approach the United States. Export diversification, we use the number equivalent of exports, uh, which is the inverse of the Heffendahl index. The idea is the more diversified you are, the more you will be exporting. Uh, I'll here on in graphs as well as some of the results. Is the relationship between income gap on the vertical axis and number equivalent on the horizontal axis if you look at ECOWAS? And as you can see, there's no clear-cut relationship. If you collapse this to look at the country means, uh, you have the expected relationship between uh, what the theory would, uh, trade theory would uh, predict is that as development occurs, you would have diversification, and diversification also helps the convergence. The idea is that countries would uh, you and develop when you focus on doing new things, rather than doing the existing things. Uh, in ECOWAS, uh, what we then looked at, we, we used this graph to sort of identify two things which will allow us to make comparisons, meaningful comparisons. The first is a country which is clearly highly diversified in the regional context and also has good convergence. So that would be Senegal. And we also then delineate an area of this to focus on those countries which have high diversification and also high convergence. Basically, it's uh, basically from five onwards and below 94 and a half we looked at that quadrant, and we also looked at the opposite quadrant. The idea here, you look at the region, try to understand what policy and institutional effects work, and then you look at uh, the best performers in, on both schools and perhaps the worst. So you have three measures, the low education, high convergence. That's approach looking at this further Mozambique. There's a huge data issue when it comes to trying to estimate direct impacts. Uh, here really the influence of South Africa is that we also looked at other variables. I would love to have time to spend here but Government deficits are going to be important. And here, freedoms assessments. Uh, they come from, these come from the Freedom House and the Fraser Institute. And they are measures, they jury measures of the quality of the underlying institutions. This is the, uh, the situation for Cape Verde. The, I, we don't have a theory, and I don't think that anybody has really a theory of how these two freedoms interact, but we do know they tend to trend together, they tend to be a positive relationship. In ECOWAS, uh, that's not very clear. In SADC, the relationship between economic and political freedom is a lot clearer. Our modeling strategy is, again, you're looking at the full sample plus these two sub-samples. We start off using um, uh, actually an OLS and two-stage least squares, so we look at the relationship both directions separately. Uh, we try, obviously, to control those typical problems, your unobserved heterogeneity, simultaneity, and we settle on the three-stage least squares because that allows us to look at the relationship at the same time both ways. So what's our model? Here it is. We have income gap and number equivalent. Uh, and then we have policy variables, some of which you can see there, inflation, government deficit, degree of openness, and institutional variables, as well as control variables. And we try to Yes, to see why these are more important in explaining this two-way relationship. 
I'll spare you the details of all the, the various tables you'll find in our paper. Just focus on the high regime in ECOWAS and the ECOWAS. And the thing we noticed is that the relationship in both these subsamples is as expected. In other words, we have diversification would bring about convergence. Convergence, diversification would do work in the other direction. Looking at the next variables, which our other analysis also identifies as important, notice that the political freedoms, for example, in SADC, increasing political freedoms and increasing economic freedoms will and the other way around. Uh, there is an interesting difference between samples, however. Predominant is towards greater diversification, whereas in SADC, stance uh, is towards less. Cases, you have freedoms, especially economic. Deficits, if for example in SADC, excessive government deficits will a prevailing tendency within the region. We take this to be a sign of regime credibility. The same holds true for ECOWAS. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words, at least that's the expectation. When we look at some of those explanatory variables and we look at the full sample, high and low, here for example, we're looking at convergence government deficit, and where, is, where do you see greatest um, a convergence precisely when you bring down, you have a government deficit which is clearly below 10%, uh, and that's in the high regime. Looking at the low regime, you don't see any relationship. If you now look at um, inflation, again, controlling inflation seems to be very important in the high regime to ensure convergence. Looking at freedoms, a rather openness first before looking at the uh, freedoms. There's no clear cut relationship uh, for the first uh, low sample, low uh, convergence. Uh, for the full sample, the relationship is, uh, is also not very clear. But when you look at uh, ECOWAS in terms of openness, it seems to be that openness is associated with a degree of uh, openness be lying between 45 to 75. We have similar results for SADC. Now I'm looking at the freedoms. This is our most striking result in terms of not only the fact that we had the two-stage least squares, as I'll refer to shortly, as being very important, but graphically, there's a clear difference between being in the low regime and high regime when it comes to the combination of political and economic freedom. The same holds true for SADC. Uh, those two-stage least squares results I refer to. Uh, here we looked at between effects and fixed effects. In a certain way, we're looking at geography and also country-specific historical, maybe, uh, uh, aspects. And economic freedom in SADC is very important. And when you're trying to look at and explain uh, income uh, convergence, uh, you see that uh, it's a combination of economic freedom and political freedom, which is very important. And the results are very strong. If you look at the tables, you'll see that the, the estimated coefficients are very strong. Uh, overall, when you look at fixed effects, economic freedom is very important. So this reinforces some of the insights that I really had in terms of the importance of the combination of policy and accompanying institutional arrangements. So what about Cape Verde, Mozambique? I mentioned there was a lack of data. Uh, our modeling strategies understand the region, understand subsamples of the region, and now we had dummies for the countries, and we used to... Uh, within the, the average regional average, but you also compare with the best performers, which we identify in the case of uh, SADC, it would be Mauritius, and in the case of uh, ECOWAS, as we saw, it was Senegal. And we see that the contribution of Cape Verde is very similar of, uh, to that of Senegal. Diversification, both countries are diversifying, and the contribution, this is in the full sample, so we, here we have the dummies which give an assessment of how these two countries are contributing to the region. Very similar between Cape Verde and Senegal. Mauritius, we don't have, we, we're not able to find a value for diversification, but uh, looking at um, the, the uh, contribution to income convergence, we see that uh, they're again very close.
some graphs which illustrate this. Here we have Cape Verde compared to the ECOWAS average, income gap to frontier, whereas the region is diverging, Cape Verde is converging. So there's clearly something specific to this country, in addition to the regional shocks perhaps which explain this last part, uh, that is worth looking at. It's clearly more diversified in the graph, as you can see, diversified increasing compared to the regional average. It's clear cut, but if you look from 1919 onwards, which is when it was a huge regime and uh, political stability, uh, the trend which had existed of increasing divergence is clearly being changed, or, and the region in fact, it's also getting worse, but the gap between Mozambique and the region is closing. Here, Mozambique is actually becoming more specialized than uh, the regional average. So, for these two countries, what you see is that they have a to the region which are broadly similar to those countries you would consider to be the best performers within their chosen policy options. We sustain that this is due to the combination of policy and institutions which they've adopted. We've measured this in a simple macro way, but hopefully this is a very first good insight as to what would constitute success and the kinds of things you would have to look into more deeply to assess these two situations. So what are conclusions? Clearly, ECOWAS is becoming more diversified, while SADC is becoming less diversified. And both Mozambique and Cape Verde are following the regional trend. So here the regional comparison is important. Uh, looking at the high regime, and here's some very good results, which I think political uh, freedom drive convergence suggesting effective uh, institutional arrangements. There's some commonalities between uh, the high regimes. These are, there's an expected two-way relationship. Uh, convergence entails macroeconomic stability. Political and economic freedoms are higher in both cases. And freedoms affect diversification policy, as do government deficits, but they do in different directions and they counteract, as I mentioned, the prevailing regional stance, which to, we take to be a sign of credibility. Uh, one final point uh, regarding Cape Verde and Mozambique. Our estimated impact for these countries, based on their coefficients, reinforces some of the, some of the intuitions and some of the results that we saw in the graph brief that we presented. Why is this important? Also important. placed to look for success because more objective way of assessing what kind of policies and what kind of institutions are likely to matter and what kind of interactions are likely to be relevant. Uh, so that's part of uh, obviously our ongoing research agenda. One of the projects I have with Witz Business School in South Africa is precisely to measure more accurately uh, event-based uh, spreadsheet, which will, is then going to be assessed by international panel, interdisciplinary panel, looking at economic aspects, constitutional aspects, and the idea is to be able to come up with indicators of civil liberties that will allow us then to have not only variables which have more variability for context-based how these challenges. We also believe that this is a contribution, and this is my final comment, to greater mutual knowledge, not only on a regional basis, but as I mentioned, uh, there is a strong argument, in our, we believe, for also historical, cultural linkages and producing mutual knowledge within a cooperative framework which tells us how to go about doing things better which is really managing resources and people so that you actually get the outcome in terms of development which all countries actively seek. Thank you very much for your attention.